And what we're focusing on is a uh, natural disaster of the first magnitude. This is probably the most uh, concentrated and uh, severe fire that has uh, existed in this part of the country uh, ever. Uh, it's a, an extraordinary natural disaster, national in scope. There's some 1,100 fires burning in California. And uh, these fires, many of them are being uh, uh, taken care of successfully. Many of them are not. Uh, many of them have combined uh, spot fires and relatively small fires have combined to form uh, very, very large fires that uh, threaten very large areas. The uh, impression that one cannot help but get is the extraordinary uh, loss of valuable resources. Hundreds of millions of dollars worth of trees uh, are being uh, destroyed and burned up. It will take uh, a dozen years, perhaps, in many instances for adequate reforestation to take place. Uh, it'll take 80 to 100 years for the resource to recover to the level that it was before this fire. Assistant Secretary of Agriculture George Dunlop was shocked by the dimensions of the disaster. So were the people who fought it, lived it, watched it, survived it. Some 775,000 acres of pine, fir, and chaparral shot up in flame. Incident commanders surveyed the Holocaust from above and below, deciding where and how to deploy the firefighting troops and materiel. Over 1,000 engine strike teams were summoned to protect life and property from an inferno that left people helpless, lost, and forlorn by its potential for destruction. In its wake, 100 recreational facilities burned to the ground and thousands of acres of streamside fish habitat were incinerated. Hand crews from across the country pressed the hot flames, scraping fire lines. On it raged, crackling like the fires of hell, blackening some 1.9 billion board feet of timber and making the human line of defenses seem frail. On they fought, wielding axes, saws, and shovels, fighting the odds. Like a great unstoppable torch, the flames leaped 40 feet into the air, traveling as fast as a mile a minute. The wall of smoke and cinders smothered some 2,800 miles. The earth appeared ruined and suffocated. It was war. SACMAC was pushed to the wall. They tracked aircraft by the minute and organized the teams of 19,000 firefighters. They concentrated on deploying manpower as though life depended on it, because it did. The sky would be active with aircraft from 32 states in the nation. Get a hold of the camp people, tell them we want their three helicopters. And they're on MNF 364 order number, request 118, 124, and 129, and they're to report to the incident base at uh, San Diego. Helibuckets drag 200 to 5,000 gallons of water on each mission. The pilots worked relentlessly with pinpoint accuracy. Overall, two million gallons of fire retardant were dropped. Heavy smoke made visibility almost impossible. Pilots risked low altitude flying, the most hazardous kind of mission, to reach areas too risky for ground crews due to thick vegetation or steepness. Jolting turbulence added to the dangers of the already hazardous work. Engine crews stood by as firefighters scaled 40 degree slopes to light backfires on ridges and in canyons. The scene at night was spooky, headlamps bobbed in the dark. Backfiring specialists were exposed to intense heat and smoke. Helotorch pilots concentrated on dropping jelly de gasoline in accurate patterns just 200 feet above the ground. 
the risk was worth it, the flames were calmed. Titus Creek, and I began to work that fire upriver. Uh, this has been probably one of the more agonizing decisions. How did the communities in these threatened areas the know what was days, taking place? George Harper, Forest Service area. Information Officer, talks about it. We initiated the public meetings to try to keep the people informed of what we were doing and do rumor control and at least try to, to get on top of the fear, so to speak, that, that comes from a sense of uncertainty. The meetings have done a tremendous job of removing that, and, and I hesitate to say prevent panic, but at least uh, kind of reduce the fear and uncertainty factor. The local people opened their hearts to the firefighters. Sue Swatton, Community Relations Director, Siskiyou Hospital. We started the Compassion Center to help the firefighters get that feeling of homey touch. We've had over four tons of things come in. We've had books, magazines, playing cards, uh, board games, cookies, candy, lots of things of a personal nature. Lots of letters from people who have firefighters in their families who just want to say a special prayer for the firefighters. The community has come together with this. They, they can't seem to do enough for us, and they are deeply committed to making sure that our firefighters, who are coming from all over the nation, are taken care of in a style that we would want our family to be taken care of. That, I think, is basically what it's all about, is these people have become our family, and, and they mean so much to us, we will never, ever forget that they were here. This one is going to be remembered by the local folks here for a long time to come. But the fact that we did use them, we did involve them in this effort, I think their memories of the fire will not be as bad as it might have been had they not been involved. So I think cooperation maybe is, is a, one of the outstanding parts of the way this fire has been managed. Towering columns of smoke rose six to eight miles into the air, curling, inverting, suffocating creating clouds that looked like an atomic blast. Engine strike teams scrambled to cover the area, often sitting in darkness that looked like midnight. Firemen were trapped in terrifying conditions. But out they came, treated by medical teams. 21 firemen involved, and they had to fall back to a safe area, an area where a fire won't burn, and they deployed their safety uh, fire shelters and these are absolutely last resort type of things. They can withstand heats up to 500 degrees for a few minutes. The fire went over these people, and to the best of my knowledge, nobody was physically injured. Now, I'm sure some of them were scared, and so they will get any kind of medical assistance that they need. Replacements rallied and went back in. The incident commander brings the troops reassurance. Evening, folks. So everybody probably knows by now that we've had an in incident within an incident and involved uh, some deployment of some shelters. All the folks are fine, uh, and they're, most of them are back in camp. I guess some of them did uh, uh, require a little bit of medical attention. And again, safety is the, the utmost. These fuels are dry, one little spot, and you've got a regular blow up. So be careful out there, OK? Thank you. Okay. Again, structure protection is the number one priority. Monitor the fire activity. Hold and improve the line. Mop up around the structures as needed. And uh, eventually, we want to uh, pursue a, an anchor line 
from Highway 120 down into the river. Yeah. Completely. I'm just... Mine was safe. I'm wiped out. Completely. I got my horses out, and the only reason I done that is because I took them down on the lower ranch the day before. I've got those. That's what I've got left. Other than that, everything else is gone. Burnt down to the ground. And it was so hot up there that I don't even have ashes on my place. How my place is still standing, I don't know. Partner of mine, it burnt right down to his backyard, and I guess the Forest Service is in there. They cut some brush out right around his back porch. If you go up there, you remember what this looks like. But anyway, to make a long story short, I was able to get back to my home uh, Wednesday at noon. And when I got there, uh, the house was standing. And uh, everything around was burnt. But the fire crew had the backs up against the house. It was obvious. There were burnt axes and burnt uh, hoses. Burning trees that they'd cut and kept away from the house. The only damage to the house is some smoke smell and uh, two cracked windows from the heat. And uh, my rain gutters were all warped because they're plastic. But the house is intact. They did a, a, man, a magnificent job. And uh, I'm sure uh, they did superhuman effort to get it. it. It was unbelievable. Evacuation meant keeping people from returning to their homes. It's well outside the fire area. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, that's the way I do That's correct. Right. The fire is still out of control. You're not allowed in that area. There's no, the, the Stanislaw National Forest is closed in its entirety. No people are allowed in the forest. The scale of human problems was immense. From the fairgrounds, they are still, uh, as far as I know, in need of denture cleanser, also uh, notepads, big baggies, and pillows. Also, they uh, are in need of a few uh, animal supplies, such as dog leashes, hamster food, fly strip, uh, exotic bird seed, sunflower seeds, puppy chow. I think I had that for dinner last night. Over two million meals were served to the homeless. But even with care, the fear and anxiety were too overwhelming for some. Now people don't see the flames threatening their homes, etc., and they're going to be getting a little tired of all of us being around. We are rapidly approaching what's known as the fifth stage of the rescue, and that shoot the rescuer. So <laughs> be sensitive to that and realize that in my eyes and in everybody's eyes in this community, you're heroes. And we want to let you leave with that image. So you got to be sensitive to what you're doing uh, out there. This fire is laying down, and it's like the fight in the fire when you got the big guy on the floor. You kick him. You don't let him get back up. Right now, the fire is laying down a little while. It has the potential of staggering to its feet. And if it does, it's going to beat the hell out of us. So kick it hard while it's down. Do it safely. Don't let it grab your foot and flip you over while you're doing it, though, okay? The Holocaust is over. The fires are out until nature decrees otherwise.